Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. Paul is head of risk management of the LDS Church. Paul Ridding says, Curtin McConkie interviewed all of John's former priesthood leaders to find out if anyone knew about abuse. And he says, okay, I've got to be careful what I say here, but for the most part, nobody knew about the abuse of Chelsea. You know, it either is or it isn't. There's no such thing as for the most part, that means that somebody knew. Right. So who knew? He said something about maybe you just don't trust any man because of what you've been through. Like <gasps> he did not. It was frustrating. He emails me one day and says, I spoke with the assistant prosecutor in Mountain Home. She told me that she doesn't need Bishop Miller to testify, that she has enough evidence otherwise and strong other witnesses. Other witnesses and she doesn't need him to testify. Yeah. And then I emailed the prosecutor and I said, This is what Paul Ridding told me. Is that true? And she said, No, um, I would never have said that because of course we would want and need the bishop to testify mm -hmm. for your case that would help immensely. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like and subscribe, become an advocate, um, showing the algorithm that you want to be a part of this channel and help me raise up survivors and expose cults and all of their abuses. So today's guest, we just did an episode with her previously. It should have been released about a day or so ago. She has been servicing in the news right now in the Mormon spaces because currently the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is under fire because of the way they are mishandling sex abuse cases and we are covering all of it. So she has been in all of the circuits. We were very happy that she agreed to come on and do not only one episode, but two episodes with us today. I'll get into her story in a second, but for now, thanks so much for joining us, Chelsea and her mom, Lorraine Goodrich. Hi, Shalise, and thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for being here. And in the first episode, if you want to go back and watch it for more context, feel free, but it's not necessary in order to continue with this one. You can go back after. But we did cover pretty extensively Chelsea's upbringing, um, the different abuses that she faced by her own father, the way that the church mishandled it um, by not telling her mother about the first time that he confessed to an authority in, within the church. And this episode, we're going to be focusing on the legal standpoint of how the church really refused to help Chelsea and Lorraine, in this case, get justice for what had happened to them. So we had just left off. What was the title of the guy, Paul Ridding? Yeah, he was is head of risk management of the LDS Church. Okay, head of risk management, which already it's like, oh, is this a corporation or a church? It's just really interesting. But yeah. you had decided through litigation because you were going to court to seek justice for what your dad had done to you. And you realized, you know what, the bishop has a full confession from my dad. So why don't I get the bishop to testify? Initially, the bishop was on board. He said, whatever you need, until he talked to the official church lawyers who said, no, you can't do that. And so you're kind of just like, what do we do next? So you contact Paul. He comes down for this meeting and that's where we left off. So go ahead and fill us in on what happens next. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I contacted Paul because coincidentally or maybe uncoincidentally, uh, he was my friend's dad. Uh, my friend who I knew from church in Los Angeles, she kept telling me, you should talk to my dad. He works for the church. Maybe he can help you. I think maybe he helps people in your situation. That was her understanding of it. And so finally I did reach out to her dad who also happened to be the head of risk management, uh, Paul Ridding. So Paul, uh, flew out here to Haley where we live in Idaho from Salt Lake city. And he met with, uh, my mom and me and 
Bishop Miller also came to the meeting and Eric Alberti, uh, you know, our friend from church who had been also assigned in church to be our home teacher. He came along as well, kind of advocating for us. And he had recently seen the movie Spotlight about the uncovering of child sex abuse in the Catholic church. And I think that as we told him our story, he kind of started to think, hmm, maybe you guys have a similar situation going on as what was going on in the Catholic church. And he wanted to know and get a feel for if Paul Ridding was there to really help us or if he's there to kind of, you know, just look out for the interests of the church and kind of maybe cover up things that could look bad for the church mm-hmm. kind of a thing. So um Eric had like this amazing sort of speech prepared and also questions prepared for Paul Ridding when we got there. And it made for a really interesting and powerful meeting. And I came there because I wanted to ask Paul basically three things. Um, I was definitely not intending or desiring to sue the church by any means. Uh, I kind of wanted to clear that up because in the church's public statement last week, they said that I had brought a civil claim against them, which wasn't true. And also that I could tell my story, which I'm glad they said that. I'm going to take that and run with it. But Mm -hmm. uh, the understanding really was, you know, that I could tell my story as it related to John, but to my dad, but not as it related to the church. But the church part of the story is inseparable from the rest of the story, Mm -hmm. you know, so I can't really tell one part without the other kind of a thing. So, uh, yeah, I wasn't coming at all to sue the church. In fact, I had recently spoken with an attorney that he wasn't officially my attorney yet at that point, but I had spoken to him and told him that we were going to talk to Paul Reading. And he was like, Oh, don't talk to him. Don't talk to him. You know, you could have a big lawsuit against the church and you could sue them. And I was like, I don't want to sue the church. I want to try to, I was still active in the church and faithful and we both were. And I think our mindset at that point was like, well, you know, we, we just want to try to communicate with the church and see if they will help us, um, kind of fix the damage that's been done with the way that the church leaders in Mountain Home handled things. And so I did ask Paul about that and I asked him, you know, why was the bishop willing to testify, but he's not now? Like, is there any way that, you know, he can testify in this criminal trial against my dad about what he knows concerning my sexual abuse? And I also told Paul, you know, in hindsight, I wouldn't tell him anything, but no, we were trusting him at the time to a great degree. And in the beginning, I should say we were. And I said, you know, my dad told me that he confessed to the state president while my dad was a bishop about my abuse. And, you know, what more can you find out about that? I wanted Paul to, I wanted to see if he could find out more information about what that state president knew uh, while I was still a child and my siblings were younger siblings were children at home. Because as far as I knew, that probably was true from the way that my dad had presented it. And, you know, we never knew and nothing had been done at the time. So And then the last thing that I wanted to talk to Paul about was the fact that my sweet mom had recently had a series of mini strokes, which was very scary for us. And she'd also gotten a diagnosis around that time of early onset Alzheimer's disease, which doesn't run in the family, but was related to the strokes, it turned out. But she was caring for my 84 year old grandma who was in heart failure while she's going through all of that, her own health crisis. And I was so scared for my mom and grandma. And I, I was really asking Paul if he could help with like my mom's medical bills, maybe her rent, if the church could just take care of my mom and grandma. So as far as any kind of financial asking, that was really all that it was. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it was just about, can the bishop testify? And what did this former church leader of my dad's or other church leaders know about the sexual abuse in the past? So that's really what we wanted to know. And 
initially, Paul seemed like he was going to try to help us. Uh, he said, well, you know, since your dad told a lot of people about the abuse, not just Bishop Miller, since he was telling, you know, a number of you in the family and uh, there was another woman that he told about his sexual abuse of me, he was like, the clergy privilege, it might not stand. Like, we might be able to say that the clergy privilege doesn't even hold anymore because your dad told other people about the abuse as well, yeah. not just the bishop. And I was like, oh, that's great. And so he kind of made it sound like that legally there was a way for the bishop to, to still testify. And I remember the bishop speaking up around that time and saying, well, I don't want to get sued. And yeah, that a lot. yeah, the bishop kept saying that and now he was like really scared about that. And Paul kind of reached over and touched the bishop's arm. And he's like, he's like, uh, it's okay. It's okay. I, the church could probably, you know, we, we can help. We could probably help with that. So it was almost like he was, I felt like trying to get the bishop to stop saying that because it looked so bad, especially in contrast yeah. to the bishop's attitude before had changed. It had changed so much. So, And the bishop's attitude only changed because he spoke with church lawyers, because previous he was like, anything you need, I'm here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He that's really was. Seemed. Yeah. He really, that's really how it seemed. He seemed on our side in the beginning and he seemed to have yeah. the courage to do the right thing. And then suddenly that went away after he talked to the church attorneys, it seemed like. So yeah, I think we felt hopeful because of Paul Ridding saying this, saying like, oh, I think that legally maybe the clergy privilege can be waived now because of your dad telling other people things about the abuse. And if Bishop Miller gets sued, you know, it sounded like maybe the church could help with that, which I think would be like a noble use of church funds, right? Uh -huh. It's like for the occasional bishop that chooses to violate clergy privilege, then the church would step in and right. help support that bishop if he got sued. Like that sounds that sounds like the right thing to do, but that's not how it ended up playing out. Which is interesting because on the live that we just did with Colby Reddish, who is a lawyer in Idaho, he had a lot to say about your case. And he even texted me, you know what, I'm going to pull it up right now because the whole thing that we were talking about was how, yeah, the clergy penitent privilege was voided because he talked to so many different people. And so he was like, I don't understand who would have put this forward as like, this is why the bishop can't testify. And so he texted me because he actually filed to get the public records. And I'm just going to read what he said. Um, Receive the public records today. Too bad we didn't have them yesterday. So this is the day after we filmed. There was never a motion or any raising of the privilege by John or his attorneys in the case. I'm going to do some additional requests to confirm, but it looks like the church lied. Shocker. <laughs> so, right, there really wasn't anything preventing, according to this, preventing Bishop Miller from testifying in your case. Wow. You know, that just... Uh... Yeah, Kobe texted something to me earlier as well about that. And it's just fully hitting me right now as we're talking about it, how strange it feels. How does that feel for you, mom? Does it feel a little emotional for you too to think about? Well, it feels to me, it feels really, I feel sad and I feel angry because here we are back embroiled in another battle to try to keep him away from children. And in, in between time, who knows who many, how many people have been hurt. Mm -hmm. besides the next victim that came forward it's it's hard to understand it's a strange feeling to realize that you know there was all this evidence including recordings of my dad admitting to a lot then bishop miller he actually knew more so much more he said way more than and, you knew and the prosecutor you know she ended up saying a lot of excuses that didn't really hold, but you know, she did say, well, if the bishop had been able to testify, that would have made a big difference. And it just feels strange to think of if that bishop, if bishop had been able to testify, like how differently things might have gone. I don't know. It's just strange. It feels yeah, strange. We won't ever know. Mm -hmm. Because what we mentioned 
<clears throat> in the previous episode was that the bishop seemed to have gotten the fullest extent of the confession because, as yeah. you just mentioned, he was confessing yeah. to things that you hadn't remembered, that nobody knew mm -hmm. about, and it seemed like that was the full picture. And then when he confessed the next step to the stake president, who was a friend of his, the story drastically changed. The stake president was diminishing, saying, well, did he even ejaculate? Does it even count? Just completely shutting you down. And so, yeah, what a difference it would have made if we could have gotten the entire story from Bishop Miller. Have you since tried to contact him or talk to him since all this has come out? He hasn't been willing to communicate with us for for a few years really since we met with paul remember when just we, about yeah because i remember sending him a message he was communicating with us quite a bit um and then after we meeting with paul i'd send emails or questions and he just stopped yeah responding yeah. which was painful because we had felt like he was an ally though mm. when we had the meeting with paul i was really surprised. I mean, the bishop had been so strong and so honest and was surprised at how he, his memory seemed, seemed like he had Alzheimer's. <laughs> he couldn't remember so much. And that was, that was the worst feeling. Like, you just mm -hmm. feel like you're in a bad dream. Yeah. And you can't wake up and feel like a betrayal. Mm -hmm. Like, like, we didn't have many allies, and then we would get one we thought, and then it would turn out that they weren't really yeah. going to hold strong yeah. with that. And this is also complete speculation on my part, but what I see here is a good man who wanted to do the right thing, talk to the official church attorneys, and they're the ones that put the fear of God in him to basically turn his back on you, which is so mm -hmm. upsetting because it seems like he really did want to do the right thing. and. For those who have never been Mormon or in a high control group, there really is something to be said about bowing down to the church leaders or to the authority above you and really setting aside your own moral compass for whatever the leaders are telling you to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also at play here, not to say he's not accountable for not stepping up because, of course, there's some responsibility there. But I just want to add context because this is a channel about cults where we talk about the patterns and the manipulation and control that that was hugely at play, at least from my perspective. Can I say that I think that day that we met, um, one of the requests that I had was my, my attorney, because my divorce trial was going, or not trial, but proceedings were going on simultaneous to the criminal. And my attorney had asked, he's not LDS, but he thought it would be helpful if one of my former leaders during the divorce trial could take the stand and just testify to my character that I did my role like a typical Mormon wife, mom would do nothing horrible, nothing fabulous, just just typical. And Chelsea had contacted several of the former priesthood leaders I had for, from bishops to stay in the stake on Facebook. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, on Facebook. And they all said, no, yeah, we can't do that. They would say like, um, I just wrote these messages to these former church leaders that had known my mom for decades and plus years. some of them had kids that I'd grown up with that you know they knew me really well and I was like can anyone just write a character witness statement for my mom like I was like you don't even have to say anything about my dad will you just say that my mom was like a good honest person because my dad is trying to defame her character mm -hmm. and I would write to all these men and they would write back things like well they would either ignore me completely or the answers I did get were like only if Salt Lake City tells us it's okay. Oh, I was like, wow. wow, you really can't even write your own. I thought you can't even write your own opinion that this was a good wo woman. Or speak it. Unless you're say. told by a higher up authority what to think and say. Oh, my gosh. And why I was bringing that forward was that was part of what I was asking for Paul in the meeting. And Paul had said, oh, yeah, I will give permission from Salt Lake. We'll make sure that you have priesthood leaders to say that you're a good person. 
And that didn't, I said, I don't want just anybody because since I was not allowed at the excommunication court and it's gotten back to me that a lot of the brethren there stated that I should be excommunicated too, based on the testimony they heard that night from John, my ex-husband. I didn't want them. I said, well, I really want the bishop to testify because I know that he knows the truth. And bishop didn't say anything in the meeting, but when the meeting was over, we walked towards the parking lot. He told me, he said, if my name shows up on a witness list, I'm going to have to be watching over my shoulder for a bullet from John when I'm out on the golf course or I'm around places, and I don't want that. So I think the bishop wasn't just afraid of a lawsuit. I mean, I know he wasn't because he said that to me, which I, I completely understood. I know what it feels like to live like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've, we've been scared. A lot of people, I think when they see a certain side of my dad, uh, can become kind of scared. Yeah, that adds a lot of context as well. Just understanding that he was so afraid of your dad and what your dad might do. While mm-hmm. simultaneously, we spoke about in the previous episode how he is a member of, quote, high esteem in the the town that you lived in. He's a dentist. He was a bishop. People really had fond feelings toward him and respected him while also now knowing that the bishop was scared to death of going against him. And so that really shows both sides of the coin. And yeah, I'm sorry that you had to deal with that. I mean, so the end of the meeting with Paul, it seemed very positive and you felt like, okay, the church is taking accountability in some way. They're going to help us. Maybe this is going to turn out okay. Mm-hmm. And that didn't really happen that way, did it? No. Yeah. So at the end of that first meeting, we did feel hopeful. And I was also telling Paul that, you know, I was hearing other stories from women in my congregation because we were still going to church then um, in the LDS church. And I was working with, uh, I'd been assigned to work with the young women, like the teenage girls. And um, there was at least one girl in there that was sharing experiences with me. Like one girl sadly had been uh, sexually abused by her dad as well. And that had not been handled well um, by a different, she had moved here from a different town in Idaho, but she was telling me like, you know, such a familiar sounding story of how that was handled by church leaders and things and family members that were Mormon. And so I was telling Paul, I was like, I think that, Cause he was kind of making it sound like when Eric Alberti asked him, Paul, do you think that sexual abuse is a problem in the LDS church? And Paul was kind of like, well, he kind of just said, no, he, he was like, you know, compared to the Catholic church and boy scouts. No. Compared to what? Yeah. He was no, like, no, that's not yeah, how it works. Answer. Either it's bad or it's not bad. Right. Right. And he was like, And, you know, I just think that there's kind of a problem overall in society of sexual abuse. Like you can't completely avoid it. And at another point in the meeting, he also said that, remember, he made some comment about, well, do you expect the church to like stop all sexual abuse? Or Or, that's the members. Do you think the church should be responsible for all abuse? Yeah. He was like, should they be responsible for all the, the sexual abuse that happens and try to stop it? And we're just like, no, but I feel like if each person will do the right thing in their little circle of influence, when they know that sexual abuse has happened and to try to support the victim and bring accountability and justice as is needed regarding the abuser, then like if everybody would just do the right thing, like in their little circle of knowledge and influence, then it would make a big difference in the world. So that's more of how I see it. But I was asking Paul in that first meeting, like, is there something the church can do to change the way that they handle these sex abuse cases in the church? Because it seems like our situation maybe isn't a one-off. I'm starting to realize that talking to other women that have been through similar things and that there's maybe a bigger issue here. And so um, that was another thing Paul was kind of like saying, oh, yeah, you know, like, the church has been trying to make changes. And if you want, like, we'll include you in, in the process of 
you know, trying to make changes to how leaders are trained and training all this stuff. Videos, and, and so yeah. I felt like hopeful about that too. I'm like, okay, yeah, like we're going to change things. We're going to, you know, make a big change. But so that was a, their first meeting, the end of our first meeting with him. And then some time passed months. It just seemed as the months went on and there were more issues with the criminal trial being moved back and things that yeah. were adding up. The criminal trial was moved back and, and then nothing was progressing with what was happening with the church. You know, would say something, but nothing was changing. Yeah. It's like Paul would say certain things that were going to happen or he was going to try to make happen. And then it just wasn't really happening. Mm-hmm. There wasn't really that follow through. And you would ask about being able to speak to the bishop about your own oh, views yeah. in terms of healing. Yeah. I also, my therapist, um, I had two therapists that were great at the time, um, a man and a woman, and they both wrote letters to the church um, expressing that from their professional opinion, based on my PTSD type symptoms, related to the abuse and recurring triggers and flashbacks and nightmares related to that, that they said it would be helpful, maybe even crucial to my healing to be able to talk to Bishop Miller and have him share with me the full truth of what he knew to help me fill in the gaps related to my abuse so that my unconscious mind could stop trying to fill in the gaps yeah. for me in a way that is not working well. Yeah. But the church declined, you know, not surprisingly that request. But initially Paul said in the meeting that he was going to request. Yeah. Get to that. And so that, that gave us hope yeah, too. In the first meeting, Paul did make it sound like maybe that could happen too. So we were hopeful for a lot of things after yeah. we spoke with him the yeah. first time. Yeah, we were hopeful. And what is a bishop for if not to speak to his the members of the congregation and help them and counsel them? I don't really understand why they're saying no, unless it's just a legal implication thing. But that's literally the point of the bishop mm. is to talk to them and to open up and to try, maybe, I don't know, feel supported. Mm-hmm. But they're just shutting you down at every turn. Yeah, it starts to become that way. And even in that first meeting, truthfully, even though Paul was being nice enough, um, we started to see that and feel that he was really there kind of as legal representation for Bishop Miller, kind of a thing to make sure that Bishop Miller kind of didn't say too much, didn't say the wrong thing, Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. So that could definitely be felt. And then after this meeting, there was a point where I was still emailing back and forth with Paul and he emails me one day and says, you know, I, I spoke with the assistant prosecutor in Mountain Home who's handling the criminal case. And he said, she told me that she doesn't need Bishop Miller to testify that she has, you know, enough evidence otherwise and strong other witnesses, other witnesses and she doesn't need him to testify. And this is the new prosecutor, right? I just want to clarify from the previous episode, you had someone who was great and this is now a new person. Yes. that per- The first prosecutor didn't get reelected. She'd been in there in that seat for a long time and she didn't get reelected, unfortunately. And it got handed to the new prosecutor's assistant, who was also his girlfriend, soon to be fiance and wife. So there wasn't like, you know, really good checks and balances. It was there was a lot of conflicts of interest and uh, my victim's advocate was also the assistant prosecutor's secretary. So that was another conflict of interest. Yeah. And the secretary told me early on that Jessica Kewen, who was the prosecutor, didn't really want to deal with my case. She felt like it had been dumped in her lap and Mm. she didn't really want to deal with it. And I don't know Uh. why secretary told me that, but I think she just was, kind of a tell all kind of person and kind of an open book book. And I was like, Oh, well, that's not comforting to hear. So I don't think that the case ended up, you know, honestly, in the best of hands, the way everything played out. However, I don't think it was helpful to hear that Paul Ridding is telling me that the prosecutor is telling him, she doesn't need the bishop to testify. Yeah. And then I emailed the prosecutor. And I said, this is what Paul Ridding told me. Is that true? And she said, no, um, I would never have said that because, of course, we would want and need the bishop to testify mm-hmm. for your case. That would help immensely. 
And so then I wrote back Paul and I said, the prosecutor says she didn't tell you that she didn't need the bishop to testify. And Paul just wrote back and said, oh, there must have been some kind of misunderstanding. So, but it gives you an idea of like communication that was going on behind my back related to, you know, what's going on with the criminal case and Paul's communications with the prosecutor. And I still don't know to this day exactly what was going on there, what was being communicated. I, I don't really know. But even in my divorce, the civil, I got a phone call from my Boise attorney one day and he said that he'd just gotten off the phone with a, an attorney or attorneys from the church in Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised. I said, oh, they called you? What did they say? He said, oh, they just called offering to help in any way that I might need them to help. And I said, you mean they're going to pay my legal fees? He said, no, no, nothing like that. I said, well, what else in my divorce are they helpful for? So that was really surprised and unsolicited. Yeah. We were I still don't know what that was really about. Yeah. We were surprised to hear that church attorneys had also been reaching out to my mom's divorce attorney and kind of trying to get involved there. That's so odd. It was odd. Yeah, I we, thought it was we odd. We still don't really know what that was about. Uh, but uh, we had a second meeting with Paul that was over the phone this time. And Eric was part of this too. It was like a conference call in, I think, May or something of 2017. We had the first meeting with Paul in March of 2017 for context. And sometime in May, he had sent us an email with an offer of a certain amount of money. We were really surprised to see that he was giving this money offer because we never thought that the church were, would give us like just a chunk of money. We were more thinking like help to with pay certain yeah, bills, help with medical help with bills, bills, help with rent for my mom and grandma. So we were surprised that he's sort of like giving this offer of money. And I wasn't sure what to think about it. So I reached out to an amazing lady attorney that I had come to learn about named Gillian DeMoss. And she lives in Oregon. And she's been part of cases representing people like in the Boy Scouts against the Mormon church case mm -hmm. and things like that. And so she has a lot of familiarity with the church attorneys uh, from that side of it. And so I reached out to her because I was feeling more trust in someone like her at that point and talking to her and I yeah. showed her the offer that the church was making. And she said, you know, this actually, from my experience, looks like a decent offer from them amount wise. And she said, I hate to say it, but I get calls from women like you almost every week to my legal firm that are in similar, a similar position as you. And even being offered money by the church and things. And she said, yeah, from, from what I typically see, this is, you know, kind of a lot uh, compared to what they normally offer. So if you need the money, then maybe you, you want to think about taking it. And at this point, there was no discussion with the church about like a, an NDA or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, around the same time, we had this phone call meeting with Paul that I mentioned earlier. And during that phone call meeting, he tells us that Kurt and McConkey, which are like the church's legal team, the LDS church's legal team, had interviewed all of my dad's former priesthood leaders to find out who knew about former sexual abuse or at your request had been requested. Yeah, I requested that. But I mean, of course, I was clueless at that time about how all this stuff works. And now, you know, of course, I see that it's like a conflict of interest that it would be church attorneys that would be calling these former priesthood leaders because naturally, I'm sure, you know, they're going to tell them, uh, give them legal counsel that's going to best benefit right. uh, the church and, and not the victim. So Paul tells us on this um, recorded conference call meeting that Eric was, and Eric was there too. Yeah, he, he said, was the president at all of the. All the meetings and the phone calls and we had no idea until the summer that he yeah. had made his own recordings oh, and yeah. never said a yeah. word yeah paul made his own not paul sorry paul. <laughs> hopefully i don't know about paul maybe, paul, maybe did too. paul did too um eric made 
his own recordings. Yeah, on his laptop. Secretly he always while had his laptop typing. there with all his questions mm-hmm. that he was typing. And yeah, but during this phone meeting, though, Paul Redding says, Curtin McConkey interviewed all of John's former priesthood leaders to find out if anyone knew about abuse. And he says, for the most part, okay, I've got to be careful what I say here, but for the most part, nobody knew about any abuse of Chelsea. For the most part. Mm -hmm. That was the most we were going to get out of Paul. I mean, I'm surprised he even said that much, Mm -hmm. to tell you the truth. I sometimes wonder if that was like some little bit of conscience coming up for him that he's like, oh, I I don't want to just flat out lie about this. So I'm just going to kind of tell a little bit of the truth and not the whole truth. I don't know. But that's uh, what he said to us. So it was pretty clear. We're like, okay, well, you know, it either is or it isn't. There's no such thing as for the most part, that means that somebody knew. So who knew? I think by this point in the conversations, we were getting pretty frustrated. Paul was getting hostile. In fact, I think in the last meeting, or was it on the phone call where he said something about you're demanding that we take care of your mother for the rest of her life. Yeah. He started using words like, we're like, he started, yeah, for the rest of my life. Yeah. He started (laughs) using words like demand. And then remember at one point too, he said something about maybe you just don't trust any man because of what you've been through. Like (gasps) he did not say something like that. The bishop was there. Yeah. Wasn't that the first meeting? Yeah. I think. And we ended up defending ourselves saying, well, that's not true. We love Eric. We're like, yeah, we trust Eric because he, this isn't about us being man haters. Yeah. I, oh, that's so infuriating. That's so demeaning and patronizing. It was frustrating. As time went on, it started to feel like, you know, a little tense uh, (laughs) between the conversation, us and him. and, And for Eric too, he was getting, at one point he said to Paul, he said, it doesn't really feel like we're getting anywhere, Paul. He was like, it feels like we're few starting months, to feel like we're months in. going in circles. Yeah. After, after a few months, uh, Eric was saying that to you and saying that to Paul. So, and Eric is such a, a very strong presence. He's very, he's very educated and intelligent and very familiar with contracts and negotiations. That's part of what he does for his living. And so he just bullet points, like if he was talking to you today, he would have already covered all the main points, like in 15 minutes or less. <laughs> yeah. He's just so good at that. Yeah. And I think almost a little intimidating in a way, because later when everything was done and he was driving Paul back to the airport after our final meeting, and he told Eric, he said, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for you. Paul said that to Eric. He said that, that. Basically, we wouldn't have been given any money if it wasn't for Eric's involvement, whatever that means. Which to me, I was like, what does that mean for all the women yes. who don't have an advocate? don't have somebody who is as educated and strong as yeah, Eric. who don't have a male yeah. advocate. You know, it, so. was, it was kind of shocking when he, Eric told me that Paul had said that to him. Yeah, like, so we wow. still don't know exactly what... Paul meant by that or you know if he I was, don't know if he was just trying to kind of like flatter Eric or like kind of I don't know manipulate him a little bit we're not sure but yeah, uh, after we had the phone conversation where Paul said for the most part nobody knew uh, the next thing we knew we, we hadn't actually accepted the, the church's original. original offer of that certain mm-hmm. amount but we were planning to and we just got we got busy with stuff going on with the criminal case and all this other stuff. And grandma whose health was yeah. rapidly Yeah. And so declining. there was a little, mm-hmm. there was a little delay in there. And the next thing we know, Paul is like, well, I'm going to fly out there again. I'm going to meet with you guys again. And I'm going to, you know, bring the offer to you officially so that if you want, you can sign it, but you can look it over and you can sign it. And we're like, Oh, this is Turning very official. Okay. Like you don't have to fly in. Yeah. yeah. That's We're great. Like, if you, that's yeah. what you want to do. And so he did fly in to Haley again. We met with him with Eric again. And this time he had like an official like contract written up. And, and this sense. time he was offering a lot more money. It was almost, well, it was more than triple, right? It was a lot more. And I mean, we're not really at liberty to say the exact numbers. I mean, I think it's out 
is probably it's, out there. It's, I think it's, it's written somewhere on our there. channel, <laughs> probably on a thumbnail yeah. or something. <laughs> it didn't come from us. It's out there, um, but we're yeah. not trying to be respectful of the non-disclosures yeah. while still speaking the truth. We're not yeah. going to talk about it because, I mean, it didn't get out there even because of us originally. So at this point, you know, we're just we're just trying to to be wise. But um, I think that we were just stunned. We were stunned. We were like, what? You're like, where did this come from? Like, we were expecting the original offer. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't know there would be contracts or anything. We just thought he would have a check. <laughs> oh, here's your check. And sorry that the bishop couldn't yeah. testify. Sorry we couldn't do more, but yeah. this should help pay for your medical mm-hmm. and your some other bills that are accruing. So we're like expecting yeah. that to happen. But uh, this time, you know, it was a contract where... It, Certain things were expected of us, which is, you know, are out there in the AP article now and some more information on the Reveal News podcast that was put out. And I think that because of my mom's difficult situation with her health at that time and my grandma's health and our finances, we were like, well, you know, uh, maybe, maybe God is blessing us in this way. We were really scared. I was especially mm-hmm. scared because and, and I wanted to get that kind of a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And I was so worried for the ramifications for Chelsea. Mm-hmm. And you don't know what's going to happen mm-hmm. to your mind. Yeah, we were definitely scared and kind of in a vulnerable position. And I think that we also felt like that we had done everything we could to try and get the truth out there about my dad by going to the police and that we had wanted the church to help with uh, getting the truth out there as well. And they weren't. And we felt like, well, if they're not going to do that, but they're just willing to help with the financial part, then at least that's something. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, yeah so that we, was actually huge at that point. Mm-hmm. And I still remember thinking that I thought to some degree, Paul was still on our side and that if anything came up in the future to do with my dad, abusing kids or doing something that the church was going to s- step in to help more. I yeah, still advocate I, in I, some way. Yeah. I still had that delusion in my mind. And so anyways, we moved forward from that, from signing the contract. And, and we also told Paul that day that he was here in town, that the prosecutor had dropped all the criminal charges. Chelsea, did you already talk about that? No. You probably did. Um, Not oh. really. No. So, <laughs> Uh, yeah, we told Paul that, um, the prosecutor had dropped the criminal charges and in that last meeting, and we were like, this is so awful. And we were telling him how she was stating that a big part of the reason was Bishop Miller not testifying, that that would have really made a difference. And, and also that witnesses that had been our witnesses had been blackmailed and now are coming forward to witness for him. Yeah. Like I told and you, my, she like, said she was wit- going to press charges mm-hmm. for witness tampering and harassment, but instead, she just said, oh, his new witnesses are really credible. We're going, the, his new witnesses, those were our witnesses. Yeah, that what? turned because of, and we had evidence. So I told you about my sister um, yeah. on our in our first meeting, Shalise, and we had her on um, a recorded phone conversation talking about everything I told you yeah. that my dad was doing to harass her. And tamper with her and shut off her utilities until she changed her witness statement. And all of that we had um, documented. And so I there think- was a grandma report with the forum police documenting all of John's phone calls trying to get, get her arrested. daughter arrested. He was telling yeah. people in the community in Mountain Home, boasting to people in the community that he was going to get his other daughter was going to be arrested and go to prison. And wow. I had people reaching out and telling me that. And mm-hmm. so... The prosecutor had all the evidence that she needed from witnesses, as well as the the Orem mm-hmm. police report of to him sh- to show witness demanding that they arrest yeah. her. But but he got away with that too. You know, he just got away with with everything. So we were telling Paul Redding about all of this in our last meeting, and he was like, "Well, that's just wrong. We as the church, we can maybe reach out to the Mountain Home Prosecutor's office, and we can put some pressure and say like." you know, well, you have an obvious confession of the criminal here on recording and you have the witnesses, credible statements, 
And why are you doing this? You know, I don't also mentioned the federal charges. Too. Do you remember what that yeah, was? About? Yeah, yeah. There was an email Paul remember. sent me saying, someone has advised me that you might be able to bring federal charges upon your dad or whatever. So he would like say these things, yeah. but then like, I don't know. Do nothing to back it up. Yeah, it was just empty yeah. words and hope, empty hope. So yeah, uh, fast forward. Before we move on, oh, are yeah, you yeah. able to talk about or give us an idea as far as what they made you sign for this money? Were you aware of what was in the contract? Did they explain it to you? Can you talk about that at all? I think that's where we're really grateful that a lot of that information already got out there mm -hmm. um, through the AP story, through the reveal story. I mean, I think that the, the most shocking parts of the contract and what they were asking us are already out there in the AP story, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where they're yeah. wanting us to basically destroy evidence and a lot of things. Um, it seems like a gag order. I mean, I'm not familiar with legal jargon, but it. I think most people would probably say that that's what it looked like. Yeah, that's. And you know, we again, Chelsea reiterated, we didn't have an attorney concerning the church. To Paul right. reading what he was offering, he gave each of us a copy of the non-disclosure, and we just let Eric take one home after the meeting, and we were going to take the other and study it because we had a little while before we had to sign it and notarize it. And so we entrusted him with the copy because we have a lot of confidence, not in him as a legal attorney, but uh, years of experience with legal contracts. Yeah, we talked to him. I talked to Gillian DeMoss again. I talked to Paul. And I think that I felt like I could still tell my story as far as my dad went. But after we signed the contract, I think over time, I began to really realize that it was going to be pretty much impossible for me to tell my story concerning the abuse from my dad and the abuse that we both received um, in the process of the truth of my dad coming forward without being able to also tell the, the church part of it, tell what had yeah. happened with the church mm -hmm. part of it, that my dad had been a Mormon bishop, that he said that he went to talk to a stake president and confess abuse. Uh, what happened, you know, when everything first came out with Bishop Miller and the way that that was handled and that we were treated in the church and the community because of that. And so I think that that combined with what I told you in the first video, Shalise, that we learned in the past year that my dad was in court fighting to have access to his grandkids mm -hmm. and that they he had were, already been spending time with them, but mm -hmm. there had been a court order to try to prevent that. The judge looked at, I think the only thing she looked at at that point was an email from the mm -hmm. prosecutor in Mountain Home that she had sent to us saying that John was a pedophile and that he needed serious treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was after she dropped the charges. Yeah. The prosecutor, she wrote me these emails that proved that showed how guilty that she knew John was and how dangerous she knew he was, but she dropped the charges anyway. Why would she do that then? I'm sorry. I'm, no. I'm trying to get my brain around this. If she clearly saw, I know. oh, this is a dangerous man, and then she drops the charges, mm -hmm. do we know why? Yeah, we still don't. We still by, don't know. My observation, I had never been involved in a legal system, I don't think even for a traffic ticket or anything in court ever. And so what I learned in this process, I believed in the justice system, but I learned in this process that we don't have a justice system. We have a legal system and the legal system tends to re-victimize victims, which is really unfortunate. And there yeah. are even laws in place to protect prosecutors to be able to do exactly mm -hmm. what this woman did. But what I learned is the person with the most money and the best attorneys not a public defender, <laughs> the best money can buy. That's probably who's going to come out ahead, regardless of confessions, mm -hmm. right. recordings, or evidence. They mm -hmm. are going to have the means by which to obtain what they want. Yeah. And, you know, there's some suspicious things. Like, obviously, Paul Ridding was contacting the prosecutor and having conversations with her. 
or at least somebody from Curtin McConkey. Yeah, the church was, and we still don't know, and we'll never really know what those conversations were about. And another thing is that she was young, like 28 years old, and knew in her career and wanted to climb the ladder in her career. And she was always telling us that she didn't really like Mountain Home. She wanted to get out of there. And I can tell you that only about a month after she dropped or less the criminal case, she started a new job at the Idaho Attorney General's office over in Boise. In Boise. Out of Mountain and Home. a lot of people were surprised by that because she didn't really have like the resume or experience to have gotten that job. And so I don't know, I can't prove it, but I can tell you that my dad's well-connected criminal defense attorney who's very well connected in the Boise area would have been in a position to possibly have gotten her that job. That's and not to say that we know that, but some others no, have suggested it. But I will speculate. It looks suspicious, but at the very least, you know, at the time that she started that new job and also got married, had a wedding and everything, was the same time that the criminal trial was scheduled to go to trial. The criminal case was scheduled to go to trial. So at the very least, I would say that that was very like inconvenient for her to have continued the with the trial. And mm. it was more convenient for her timing wise to have just dropped it. So yeah, um, we'll never know like a lot of I things. think the full truth of like why she really did that. I can tell you that we were just totally stunned at the time that she did that. It was just, it was like getting hit by a train. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it was horrible. We had driven a, almost two hours, hour and a half or more. She told us that we needed to come for trial yeah, prep. She, and so she, we came down. She said, come to Mountain Home for trial prep. So we drove. But she knew very well that that's not what we were driving. Yeah, on we for. drove almost two hours to Mountain Home. For <sighs> trial was, prep that ended up a tough day. being just her sitting there saying, we're dropping the charges. I'm dropping this case. And oh. I was like, what? Why? And she would say a reason and I would be like, but we have recordings, but we have a confession. And then she would give another reason. And, and at one point she actually said to me, uh, she said, I just don't think that we could prove to a jury, especially a jury in Mountain Home, that anything that your father did to you was anything other than natural fatherly affection. <gasps> Don't even get me started. Chelsea, I'm going to throw up. And when she said that, I, I said, Jessica, he says on the recordings, he's getting erections. He's sexually turned on. And she pointed over to her secretary and said, well, John could go over and be getting erections all over and rubbing on her. And it's not illegal. I said, it would be if she was a minor. What? I just, it didn't matter what we said. We just went around, matter. And around and then for I two finally, hours. I, I said, I, I pointed out to her, I was like, what about when... My dad says on recording that his penis was on my bum and down where private parts are and that it freaked him out. And the evil spirits were telling him to get in the bed with me. And she was like, well, where did that happen? And I said, well, he's like referring to what happened in uh, the hotel room back east, specifically on the there. school field trip. And she goes, well, I guess you're just going to have to go get help from them. Like, I guess, you know, like saying from the people back east. It was very east. flippant. Yeah. Oh, I mean, honestly, she was just. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, she's very rude. And I will say the first prosecutor we were working with, she was just complete opposite. She would never have treated us that way. She was very amazing. And Colby Reddish actually knows her. Um, and they work together. They, and he said, project. he said, yeah, she's, she's amazing. And, and we agree. And I don't know why everything turned out the way that it did and why the case had to be put into the hands of someone who was handling it so differently from how the first prosecutor was handled. How it should have been handled. I don't know. There's a lot of things that I will never understand, but I'm sure, you know, everyone feels that way about something in life because it seems like that's just life sometimes. Oh but, my gosh. So mm -hmm. aggravating. Everything that you guys had to go through. For me, one of the most painful things that day when we got there and she told us that she was dropping charges was that she had obtained a recording from John, my ex-husband's criminal defense attorney, John had hired a private detective to go to another city, Idaho Falls, and interview my daughter and son-in-law, who were now his witnesses, not ours. They'd switch sides. And she told us some of the things that they, she kept saying. She's such a credible witness. She's so credible. And she was telling us some of the things that she said that were so credible, like mm -hmm. that I had 
sued her, served a lawsuit to her while she was in labor. I'd never, ever, ever done anything like that. Mm-hmm. And the list just went on and on. And she said, she's just very credible. So that along with the bishop not testifying mm-hmm. and now your family's testifying against you. And we she's were like, to drop the charge. We were like, how is my sister credible when she wrote one witness statement and, and now, audio recordings yeah, as and, well? And now she's writing a completely different witness statement. And oh. we have solid proof for you that my dad was harassing her and blackmailing her yeah. with a crime so that she obvious. did as a teenager. <laughs> and she's like, well, that's their new star witness. And I, I remember saying to her, well, why don't we just pull a new star witness out of our asses? Because that's yeah. what we just did. I was so, mm-hmm. I was, I was hurt that my daughter would take it this far. Yeah. I was angry that the prosecutor who knew absolutely better, mm-hmm. she knew the truth. And we asked if we could have hear the recording so we could defend ourselves. And she said, I'll send it to you the next day. And we could never get it from her. You had to get it later. Chelsea had to get it later in, uh, as part of a lawsuit that she brought against her dad as some kind of, some kind of accountability for what he'd done. Mm -hmm. But otherwise we would never have heard it. (laughs) When I heard it, I was even more shocked than just the stuff that the prosecutor had told us that day. Yeah, yeah, it was it was hard for a mom to hear. You know, another thing that's suspicious is that my parents' divorce case was scheduled to go to trial just a couple of weeks after Miss Kewen dropped the criminal case. And in that divorce case, all of the same evidence and all of the same witnesses recordings. and recordings were gonna come Emails. forward into court in Mountain Home before the same judge that that my criminal case was supposed to go before. And that I had testified before in trial, in preliminary trial. Anyways, it's just suspicious because, you know, the judge was going to see all this evidence that Miss Kewen just ignored threw out. that she threw out. Not just the judge, the whole community. Yeah. Half of the community was witnesses, either on my husband's yeah, side. The or community on my was side. going we heard people were it was planning an open hearing. So people were planning to pop mm-hmm. popcorn and plant for a couple of days and it's a small town. It's pretty big news. Yeah. And so the truth was going to come out and it was also going to make Miss Kewen look bad for closing the case with prejudice, which right. means that it, it can't be reopened uh, even if new evidence came forward. And we've heard since then that that's very rare in a child sex abuse case that anyone would close it, that a prosecutor would close it with prejudice. So but that just kind of locks it shut. Yeah. Nobody ever gets to look yeah. over here again. And so the next thing we knew, right before my parents' divorce was supposed to go into trial, three days before trial, we get this uh, statement that my attorney, yeah, that Miss Kewen had reached out and given my mom's attorney that was saying that my mom had asked her, the prosecutor, to fabricate and make up a witness and to do that for the criminal trial, which of course never happened, makes no sense because we already had good witnesses. And she wasn't even interviewing the ones that we had, like Sherry Tanner, you know, the woman that, um, oh, we haven't even talked about that. The woman that my dad drug raped in Boise, uh, after that woman saw my story come out in the news, she had recently had an experience where my dad had drugged her and had sex with her unconscious, like, well, she was not conscious on this drug. And she was debating if she should go to the police and report it or not. But when she saw my story come out, she was like, "Ooh, this man is dangerous. I definitely need to go and tell my story too about him. To the police. And so she went to the police and that's a whole nother story in and of itself. I, I'll, I'll just, I'll just but go off on that tangent if you want. she was one of later and she yeah, had recordings she, that she had made of John confessing to abusing Chelsea yeah, she, for years. She had oh. recorded phone conversations the that she had with my dad would never talk to where her. Where my dad admitted to drug raping her and he also told her more things about my sexual abuse like that he had had erections on and around me all the time and all the stuff uh, he told Sherry. So anyways, um, we can wrap up that part of it but basically, you know, because the prosecutor made this false statement against my mom um, that caused my mom's divorce attorney to give her counsel to just settle out of court because it was looking too complicated. So that's what they did. But, you know, that prevented the truth from coming out in court again, oh. which protected, mm-hmm. which protected the, uh, prosecutor's image, right? 
So, um, but, and then she came out in the media. Oh yeah. Then she, and she, said that I had asked her to lie. Yeah. She, so that if I did come mm-hmm. forward, no one's going to believe me now. Right. Oh, she made would a prosecutor gosh. lie. Yep. That prosecutor made public statements about both of us that were uh, outlandish. Falls. And the Mountain Home News was using my name right and left. And I contacted them and was like, uh, I don't think you're supposed to be printing my name as a victim. And Gillian DeMoss contacted SNAP, which stands for Survivors Network of People Abused by Priests. And the SNAP network was mortified. And they wrote to the Mountain Home News and they were like, you know, as a victim's advocacy organization, we're just horrified that you're just printing this woman's name in the paper without yeah. like her permission because she's a victim and the mountain home news was just flippant uh later the idaho statesman paper that's a whole nother story but they printed that was bad yeah they printed basically that john had been excommunicated for having bad thoughts they didn't bother to mention that there were even recordings of confessions they didn't mention that recordings had been given to them they said he'd been excommunicated for bad thoughts which i was thinking you know anyone who's mormon knows better than that that yeah that, wouldn't be a thing. And they interviewed uh, her sister, my other daughter, who told them that she kept, Chelsea kept changing her story. So they printed that. Yeah. They made me look like a liar and they ended off quoting me, misquoting me out of context by saying something to the effect of like, you know, that I was just kind of doing this all so I could sue my dad for money. <laughs> Anyways, the, the media has been terrible and the AP of course did a way better job. Um, they still watered down my abuse to the point that that was a little triggering the way that they printed some things like saying that my dad came and apologized to me for getting aroused in the pool. I was like, no, as if I mean, a nine year old girl, he didn't, would even he didn't use that word, that. but if they were going to use a word describing what happened that didn't even get used in the conversation, they just should have said molested because that's what he was. That's what yeah. he did. And that's what he was saying that he did. But you know, I, I don't know. I think that the press, um, has to sometimes protect themselves too. And whenever you turn your story over to the press, it's in their hands and they're going to kind of have their own agendas or their own uh, perspectives and they're going to do with it what they're going to do. And I, I knew I was taking that risk when the AP reached out to me and I chose to talk to them. I had already had, we'd already both had such bad experiences oh. with with the media um, that the the bar was really low. So I still feel like they did great compared to anybody else. But um, getting back to the Sherry Tanner thing, she... And we can use that name. It's all over. Yeah. Out there. Sherry it's told us here. that that's whatever with her name. So as far she, as she's concerned, it's all in legal documents. Yeah. So, as well. so she went first to a prosecutor that had scheduled a grand jury. And he said, we're going to take this guy down on the sex abuse, uh, the sex sexual assault that he did of you and for drugging you. And it was all scheduled and Sherry had even canceled a trip, a flight from Boise back to Michigan um, in preparation for the grand jury that was scheduled. And then she got some of our statements, you know, where we're writing about how just our whole story, including that John had been a bishop and that we were Mormon and everything like that. She thought it would be helpful to provide this prosecutor and she, Boise, she took these to statements see the pattern to this of prosecutor predatorial behavior. Mm-hmm, sure. But what she didn't know is that this prosecutor was Mormon and he does legal work for the church. And as soon as he saw our statements and he realized we were Mormon, that John was Mormon and a former Mormon bishop, uh, all of a sudden he, as Sherry put it, did a 180 and was like, Oh, we're actually not going to prosecute this. And she's like, why? And, Said, well, it was I think, scheduled. A grand jury was scheduled. He said, well, I think uh, that we lost some evidence. The Mountain Home Police lost the evidence from your phone. Your recordings. And, and so it'll just be your word against his word. So And so she contacted, oh. yeah, so she contacted the Mountain Home Police and they were like, no. They were like, let us double check. Nope. We still have everything. said, hold on. He put her on hold and he came back and said, the phone's right here. It has everything. Yeah. And the officer. this prosecutor had also told her that the prosecutor in Mountain Home didn't want them to arrest John on those charges because it could distract from theirs. And so Sherry contacted her and we contacted her and she said, I never said that. I was actually looking forward to it. It it, it yeah. proves my case more. So she had been lied to by this Sherry was lied to, yeah. And so she was devastated. She she was so upset that she told, you know, the prosecutor's office in Boise, she was like, I'm gonna take 
my recordings and all this evidence. And I'm going to go to the media and I'm going to tell them that what be- you've done. That because this guy was Mormon, it looks like he's wanting to cover this up for another Mormon guy, you know, mm-hmm. and for the, church. the church. And I mean. so then they were like, no, 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 we'll assign you a new prosecutor. So they assigned her a, a new prosecutor who wasn't Mormon. And that prosecutor got her some justice because my dad ended up getting sentenced on drugging Sherry illegally. And he got a felony for that. He got three years of probation and I think 90 days work release jail time. Yeah, 90 days work release jail time, but he got the felony. The judge but, never heard the recording, so he didn't even know there was a sex crime. That's the sad thing is that because of a plea deal, involved. because of a plea deal, the judge never got to hear the recordings uh, where my dad is admitting to raping Sherry. Um, the judge never even got to see or hear those. So, of course, the judge wasn't going to sentence him on sexual assault because the judge didn't get to see the evidence for that. So that that's what happens, you know, with plea deals. Uh, and I think that there's a lot that needs to change with legislation around, obviously, both the clergy privilege law and also just other laws with related to sexual predators and how they're handled, including plea deals. <laughs> oh my gosh. Th- this is so layered and complex and I'm just fuming <laughs> that this guy is. is just getting away with all of this stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. I am not a lawyer. I feel like we need to get Colby on this. Is there something <laughs> that can still be done to seek justice, to put him away? He's clearly dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. That's really where it came to for us um, when we realized that my niece and nephews are in danger, that my dad is still a practicing dentist in the state of Idaho. And yeah, we thought he had sold his practice and retired and we're surprised that mm-hmm. he just moved to Boise yeah. and took on a new look. He grew this Fu Manchu type mustache yeah, he, and it goes by the mm-hmm. name of Duke. Yeah, he changed, of John. he changed his appearance quite a lot before he was like this clean shaven, like preppy Mormon dentist. (laughs) Yeah. Mormon Bishop looking guy. And now he's got like this big mustache and dresses kind of like cowboyish and goes by Duke. Dr. Duke. Yeah. He goes by like a new name. Yeah. And it's not, we really (laughs) didn't want to step back into, I mean, Chelsea had, you know, it had been years and we tried to make the best as we could of our lives and move forward. And she had just finished a three-year master's program in clinical psychotherapy and was preparing to set up her practice and to work in that when the situation arised for her to get a subpoena to testify. Yeah. Um, because part of that non-disclosure had a little tiny caveat that, of course, all that was sealed up except with the exception of a court order subpoena. And so who would have imagined a situation would come yeah. that that would actually that would happen. And Mm -hmm. once he saw that things were entered into the legal system, he could see that she was on, she had been subpoenaed. Oh yeah. My, my dad, when he found out that I'd been subpoenaed to be deposed this year to witness in the divorce case on behalf of my niece and nephews and for their protection, uh, my dad sent me a threat letter. It was like notarized notarized and and witnessed whatever. Yeah. um, By himself. Yeah, he, he was. A, he signed his own witness. Witness line, by him. But, yeah, we thought that was kind of weird. But anyway, so he sent this threat letter, um, saying that he was going to, if I testified, he's going to sue me. Uh, take away your professional license. He's going to take away. Yeah, my. He's going to destroy my career. And anyway, so I mean, you consider that a subpoena is a court order to appear. Yeah. So he was demanding. He was putting in the, the position that you. You ignore the court order, which means you could go to jail, you're in contempt of court, or you do what I say. Yeah. Or I'm going to harm you in some, whatever ways I can. And so that was a really scary time. That was scary. Honestly, um, mm-hmm. we did not stay in our home for several months no. during that time. We had some sweet friends that let us live in their home for a few months earlier this year so that we could during the safer. deposition time and, and when all that, that was going time. on. Yeah. So that. it's been. Mm-hmm. It's been a, a year that we didn't expect, but knowing that my grandchildren are in danger, if not worse already, I know that other people's are too. It isn't just about my grandchildren. Mm-hmm. It's about everyone's children. And 
clearly not just children. Mm -hmm. um, when he has access to this conscious amnesia drug, and if you go on the website where he's currently working, it's posted up that they offer that service, and most mm -hmm. dental offices don't. He did in Mountain Home and felt that he was, he was very proud that he did that when most dentists don't. So that clinic is now offering, meaning he yeah, has access the to he's, he's at. the conscious amnesia drug mm -hmm. that he uses yeah. there. So yeah, and I and I don't think I mentioned this, but in that Statesman article about the Sherry Tanner case, the Idaho Dental Association said that after John got his felony, they told the media that they were going to take away his dental license. And that never happened. Instead, I guess they sent him to some kind of training, like weekend training for dentists with boundary issues in Texas, something like that. Um, very strange. Instead of just taking away his license. So he like sexual sexual assault of a patient is a boundary issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so he's still practicing with an unrestricted restricted license. And Sherry Tanner had re had provided the Idaho Dental Board with the audio recordings mm -hmm. of him asking her to lie to the police and say this was consensual, him asking her to lie and say there were no drugs involved. Mm -hmm. They had those recordings. And on the same recordings, they heard him talking about abusing Chelsea mm -hmm. for years. Yeah, so here you see like this whole system working together where... Uh, you've got the church, you know, that let him go free, the criminal system, the Idaho Dental Board. Professional And systems. it reminds me of an article that the AP printed a few years ago, ago about privileged professions. I think the title had something to do with privileged professions. Really and good article. It was about like how, kind of like what I told you, Shalise, that Tina Shinley, the first prosecutor, told me at the beginning of the criminal case when she said, you know, the prisons aren't full of wealthy, well-connected pedophiles generally and or sex offenders. And uh, I think that this article the AP did was kind of talking about that. Like, why do people who are dentists and doctors and attorneys, why do they get away with sometimes just the most blatant, heinous crimes mm -hmm. that other people that don't have that status in society aren't like an important man in society don't get away with. Mm -hmm. It's a good I question. I think you saw that recently with the Oregon case with the Oregon doctor right. that had abused so many LDS women and it went on for years. Over 200 women. Yeah. And if he had been a janitor, I don't know that it had, would have gone on that successfully mm -hmm. that long. But the wealthy, privileged professions, mm -hmm. that article is a wor worth a read. I, I can really see that playing out in our case. Yeah, I don't. Did I tell you? I don't think I told you that yet, Shalise, that when my sister had her first child, that that little girl was in danger of my dad because my sister had moved in for a little while with my dad, with her little girl. Mm -hmm. And it was so unbelievable. Yeah. But you have to realize this was just shortly after the criminal case had been dropped in a small town. So in order to freshen up the PR, no, everybody would know that nobody's going to move their child in if their dad's a pedophile, right? Yeah. And so, and my dad was, he had pressured her. Mm -hmm. He was footing the bill for, for and her, and her new her her, husband for her life, at least for her. I don't, but her husband was, uh, he didn't know as much as her though. She knew so much better, but yeah, I was so scared for my little niece. And so we couldn't believe it when we heard that they'd moved that baby into the home with him. Yeah. It, again, was like a nightmare that won't end. Yeah. I thought, what did we go through all yeah. this for to protect my grandkids? If you're going to choose mm -hmm. yeah. to risk, put your child in such harm's way. Yeah. It was like our worst nightmare. So I actually wrote a, an email to Paul Ridding at that time. This was like after everything. Uh, this was after, you know, we had signed the contract with him and everything. Like six months later. So a few months later and I reached out and I was like, Paul, I was like, <laughs> Do you realize like my sister has moved in with my dad with her little child and I'm really concerned. And Paul wrote back and he was like, yeah, the church is very concerned as well. That's what he wrote. And he said, you know, there's really nothing that we can do, though, like except for pray for them. And uh, um, don't give me that pray for them BS. Yeah. And he said. And I, you know, he could see that I wasn't going to, that was not going to work for me. And he was like, well, but 
you know, we could um, reach out to Bishop Miller. The church could reach out to Bishop Miller and tell him to talk to your sister and brother-in-law. And I was like, to oh, take him aside. I was like, yeah, please, like anything, you know. Because we felt that, especially my son-in-law, was, you know, very, very devoted to the church yeah. and sees the higher up church members oh, yeah. as the authority. So yeah. we thought if they were to tell him, yeah, my brother-in-law would get your baby and get out of there. Yeah, my brother-in-law yeah. would have definitely obeyed what Bishop Miller said, but the church never did that. I mean, according to what I, I talked to my brother-in-law later, and he said so that no, never happened. He said no, that never happened. He said I absolutely would have listened to Bishop Miller, and obviously Bishop Miller knew how dangerous John was more than anybody else. Yeah, <laughs> Bishop Miller had more knowledge of that than anyone else. Well, although I guess all of the attorneys at the helpline also know and maybe because, the social workers who answer the phone and maybe the social workers at the helpline it you know it's like where does the clergy privilege like who gets that the privilege of getting to know what the confession was nobody but the attorneys i guess or like it's just kind of weird you know like we can't yeah. know but but all these people at a helpline can know yeah what my dad did to abuse me it's so strange Oh, wow. You guys have been through so much and I can't even imagine how hard that must have been mentally, just one thing after the other. And I mean, how are you doing now? Are you coming up for air? I mean, I imagine that there's still a lot of pain there, of course. Yeah, I'll I'll finish up really quick, Shalise, by saying that um, after I reached out to Paul and I could see the church wasn't going to do anything about the little girl, I reached out also to Elmore County, like the police and prosecutor, and they ignored me. And then I reached out to the Idaho Attorney General's office. I emailed the Idaho Attorney General and his office responded, replied to me and said, well, you know, yeah, there, there may be a problem here. And uh, the prosecutor, you know, she may have been in the wrong to Who knows? drop that case, but they said, we can't investigate into this because since Miss Kewen now works for our office, that would be a conflict of interest for us to investigate into this. Oh, just when I thought that it was over, there's more? Chelsea, yeah, my yeah. goodness. But the Idaho Attorney General is LDS, has been for 20 years, each one succeeding. Those that work in the office, mm -hmm. there's a high percentage They're of all LDS more there. They're um, running the state. So I don't know. It just it reached such a hopeless place. And I guess to answer your question, if we're doing better, I think that we did have a couple years of peace where we weren't we just kind of stepped away from this whole battle and we were like okay you know what more can we do and then this year everything surfacing you know with my sister's divorce case and us uh wanting to help protect my niece and nephews mm -hmm. uh it's been a rough year again it's been really intense and challenging because you know i think that I don't want to sound self-righteous here or something, but I think that doing the right thing often is hard. It's never yeah. easy. It doesn't mean that it stays hard forever, but it means that when you push against the system, right? And when you try to fight against powerful people who have more power than you, who are willing to do just about anything to serve their means and ends, even at the expense of others, when you're pushing against that kind of thing, then yeah, things are probably going to get worse before they get better, you know? Yeah. How about you, Lorraine? How are you doing? Yeah. You know, I think in some ways, kind of reiterating what Chelsea just said, that when you step into that arena to call out sexual abuse, that there's a chance if the person you're going up against is powerful and influential, you may get crushed. Like uh, my health. I had way more than just seven strokes. There were so many diagnoses. I was shutting down. I was dying. But what I learned in this process is they can't destroy your soul. They can't destroy your dignity. And, you know, with God's help, we were able to rebuild a lot of those things that were taken from us, crushed. I, I lost half my family. I lost my beautiful home. I lost my community. I lost my religion. I lost a lot, but I never lost 
my my soul, my determination to rise above and to continue to tell the truth. You know, one of the things that came forward when Miss Kewen called us in to drop the charges, to tell us that she was dropping the charges, she referred to the recording and my other daughter and her husband as being these brand new excellent witnesses against me. Later, we did get the recording. And at the end of the recording, my son-in-law said they said a lot of things about me (laughs) that made me a lot more fiery and exciting of a life than I had. But one of the things that he said at the end was he said to this private detective on this recording, he said, you know, Lorraine seems to think she's on some some kind of mission from God to protect children. He said it kind of sarcastically. He said it, you know, mockingly. And I remember we paused it when we finally listened to it. And I said, shouldn't we all, aren't we all supposed to be here to protect yeah. children and vulnerable people? Like it's making fun of me, but <laughs> I actually took it as a compliment. And the irony is truth will eventually come out. And now we're back in that, you know, that arena, that battle with that same person trying now to help to be on a mission from God to protect his children. Mm -hmm. So I think that people can crush you in the process of truth, but they can't take who you are away. They can't take your soul and your, your spirit and your fight. Sometimes it feels like they did take you, your spirit, but they can't really do that. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that, mm-hmm. that yeah. they couldn't control my, my mind. You know, they, they had a lot of control, but I couldn't take away who we were. Mm-hmm. Well, just from my perspective, I have to thank you for everything that you've done for Chelsea and for your grandkids. I was <laughs> kidding. I'm like holding back tears because I really see so much of my own mom and you and just the way that you stood up for Chelsea, oh my gosh, don't cry, um, is so beautiful because we know by statistics that not often do the mothers stand by their children when there is abuse in the home. And so what you've done is incredible. And I'm so happy that Chelsea has you and that you have the relationship that you have. We've been really fortunate. Thank you for that. It just... I've had other people say that, but I never felt courageous. I felt afraid the whole time, but I just, I didn't feel like there was any option, but rather than to stand up and tell the truth. And yeah, I don't feel brave. I just, I feel like a survivor myself of all of this. So but thank you for that. If my courage, I guess it was courage can help inspire somebody else in a similar situation. It won't be easy. In fact, it may be the worst hell you've ever been through, but yeah. I get to know that I, it's not on me anymore. Yeah. What he does, it's not on me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would second that. And you're right, Chalice. My mom is incredibly courageous, and I can't imagine what I would do without her, and what I would have done if she had responded to all of this differently than she did, um, than standing by me and with me, and being willing to walk away from my dad, even though she was going to go through such hell in that process. And I think that what my mom just said is a lot of our message for people is that, yes, if you speak up against, especially a powerful abuser, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. But then you get to still have your integrity. You still get to have your soul. You still get to be able to look in the mirror and sleep at night. Well, I still don't sleep at night, but, (laughs) um, but you you still get to, you know, you don't have to wonder if you had done something differently or done the right thing that maybe then, you know, a kid that got abused wouldn't have gotten abused. It's not like we really have control over those things, but at the same time, all we can do is what's in our power of our little circle of influence to do that's right. And beyond that, if something still goes bad, you don't have to feel like you didn't do your part and you didn't at least try. And we do feel that way that we at least we have tried. We're still trying now, uh, even though we were ready to have this all be behind us. It really can't be because so many other people wouldn't do the right thing, you know, including the church and knowing what they know and knows more than I do about my abuse and about the danger that John is to children but what are they doing now? You know, are they, are they 
lobbying to change legislation so that the clergy privilege law is changed enough so that at least the pedophiles aren't protected by that. They're lobbying the opposite. They're lobbying They're to the keep opposite. the laws in place. Yeah. They're doing the opposite. And, you know, for those out there that consider themselves Christian or followers of Jesus Christ, I would say that, you know, what Jesus Christ taught is completely the opposite of how these situations are being handled within the LDS church and other Christian churches. It, you know, Christ made it very clear how he sees those that would harm one of his little ones. He said it would be better that a millstone should be tied around their neck and they'd be cast into the depths of the ocean. But that's very different from what we've heard, you know, be said by these church representatives saying that they're keeping the legal clergy privilege law in place because uh, it protects the souls or helps the souls of the predator. the soul of the predator. But I would ask, is saving the soul of a predator who would harm one of these, my little ones, as mm -hmm. Christ said, so much more important than the little one? Yeah. Right. It doesn't make H sense How does to that me. work? How does that work? And something else that occurred to me recently is, you know, this concept of what Pontius Pilate did to Jesus Christ. At the end, we all know that story that he looked at and spoke with Christ and knew who he was and knew he was innocent, but he was too afraid to do the right thing in the face of what everyone else was saying and doing and demanding. And so he turned his back on Jesus Christ and then he washed his hands, you know, symbolically, like I wash my hands of this and I walk away from it. So I'm, I'm not responsible. And I feel like that's what a lot of people in the LDS church do and the leader, the, the legal system and the leadership seems to be doing and sometimes in the legal system and certainly uh, in people's personal relationships with their families. You know, there was things said to me by certain LDS family, particularly on my dad's side along the lines of, you know, that I just needed to, to let go of this. And that that was the Christ like thing to do was to not speak out about this and to just let it go. I've heard the exact same thing from my extended family. Mm -hmm. And that basically yeah. like you're not even a true Christian and you're not forgiving if you don't just completely forget about all of this and let it go. And it's just, it's just not, it's not true. It's not right. It's not true. And it's not what Jesus Christ taught either. So just, you know, think about yeah. that for those that consider themselves, if you want to follow the doctrine of Jesus Christ for real, Look at how what is being done in the LDS church with how these things are being handled actually contradicts that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as we speak today, do I have it correct that both of you have walked away from the LDS church? Yeah, we're members of record, but we don't attend anymore. It no longer felt like a safe place for us to be. And I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. I don't know how I could raise a family there if I ever have a family and children. I don't know how I could live with myself raising a family in the church unless the church were to really drastically change how they handle these types of things so that it could be a safe place, you know? Yeah. Do you think that you're, or do you feel that you're doing a lot better now that you're out of that paradigm? Yeah. I think that we, how do you feel, mom? We talk a lot about this. Yeah, we do. Um, I think it's still challenging. We live in a, a small community that has a lot of LDS. And in some ways, I think they're really glad we're gone in some ways because they really did not know what to do with us when we moved here. It's kind of like people have a hard time when someone's passed away knowing what to say, but people knew. And so people just kind of avoided us. Um, people don't know how to handle people who are different mm -hmm. a lot of times in the church, right? Like, it's a family centered church. So if you're not the typical husband, wife and kids family and you come in with a different dynamic and different story, it's people don't, you don't fit in. Yeah. They don't know what to do or what mm -hmm. to say. And, and I kind of get that to some degree, but I always say, where does that leave the victims? If you mm -hmm. can't reach out, if you can't talk to them and there were other extenuating circumstances too, when we moved here that, we probably won't go into because it's another hour, but, but more experiences with the church, not wanting to protect 
the innocent and do the right thing when there's a predator. Mm -hmm. Again, we, up we here, it was more of that, more of that. And so it just started to become too eye opening. It just, again, like Chelsea said, it was no longer safe to yeah. be in the congregation mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. And I'm not, it's not something that I take joy in saying, and there are many things I love the church. It was my life for m most of my life. Mm -hmm. And there were things about it that I really appreciated. But when you have to weigh out your safety and well-being versus certain aspects of enjoying singing the hymns or the social, it's not worth the trade-off when it's not being true to what you've seen and what you've yeah. been through. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that you're doing better now, that you're in a better headspace. Thank you. And yeah, your relationship is beautiful and inspirational. And I guess, is there something that you want to talk about that makes you happy now, your consciousness side of the story, mm -hmm. something that brings you peace? Yeah, I mean, we still uh, have a strong faith in God. And we pray, we pray on our own, but also together. And we still... Oh feel that there's a power in prayer and that we've seen miracles happen when we pray with full purpose of heart and try to do our part. And I think that we have found some new friends through this process, including you, Shalise, mm -hmm. that that's very special because we have felt really isolated, uh, especially, you know, when we didn't feel safe in the church anymore. And we walked away from that. It just felt so I'm sure a lot of people can relate. It just felt so isolating and we just we haven't lost. Yeah. We felt know, kind of like lost. The church was your life and identity. Like mm -hmm. you have to figure out who you are without that. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. a process, but there's good, you know, on my birthday this year in August for the first time, I got to meet my three grandkids, mm. six, four and one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's been exciting to be a little part of their lives because I hadn't been able to meet them because of things that had happened. And so that had been incredibly painful. And so it's been really fun and exciting for me mm -hmm. to be able to have them to some degree right now. A little bit in your life. Yeah. yeah. I, and it's just, yeah, that was the most fun thing I've ever done. I knew my mom, she was so worried about meeting the kids because she was like, you know, what if what if your sister uses that like against the kids or like creates more complicated situations so for, for the those kids children. because of how complicated things have been. And, and I was like, you know, I agree, but it just reached a point where I thought it's just, it's so wrong. Like I just want my mom to meet her grandkids to be able to yeah. meet them. And so uh, I surprised her. I was like, we're, I was like, we're going to the zoo to meet this other friend. And anyways, Aww. and the, the, to the zoo, I'm like, this is my birthday. And you're taking me to the zoo. <laughs> She's like, that's kind of weird. I was like, that is you're like, okay. kind of weird. Yeah. And it's in Boise. So it's almost three hours to go to the yeah. zoo. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was all a big uh, ruse because when I got there, uh, it was my, my brother-in-law with the kids and, and uh, we both just, we just fell in love yeah. with the kids. They're so precious. Love and, at first sight for a grandma, and, right? You know, I wish I don't, you know, my sister, I don't think knew about any of that. And I wish things could be different and I hope one day that they could be, but so much would have to change and heal before our family could, could be semi whole again, you know, but yeah. that's, that's a little start in the that's right direction. A little of the right? happy thing. So we find lots of things to do that we feel are contributing and positive and it's always gratifying to feel like you're making a change or helping somebody else in a little way, even yeah. like what we're doing right now with you to feel like, you know, there will be people who judge in whatever way they're going to, mm -hmm. but there will also be people who feel encouraged by what we're willing to do. Yeah. That's our hope. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm sure this story is going to be inspirational and validating for many people watching. And before we wrap up, is there anything that people can do to help support you guys? Is there something that can be done? We just want each person to do the right thing within their own circle of influence when it comes to supporting victims. Mm -hmm. And don't look the other way. Don't look the other way. And the right thing when it comes to making sure that 
the sexual predators are reported to the proper authorities. Again, even if those authorities don't always do what needs to be done exactly how we would want. Just do your part. Just do your part because then you know that it's not on you. And I would say that we also want victims themselves to know that they are not alone. They're not alone and that they are seen and heard and loved by many other people out there like us and like you, Shalise, mm -hmm. who do understand and who do get it. Yeah. And so thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. You're doing is reaching way more people than we probably ever will. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You're on the same kind of mission is just to help wake people up and to protect people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you guys. We're friends now. <laughs> you don't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> <We're friends>. um, <laughs> so, okay. Then I just need your Linda Listen moments, both of you. Either a sassy statement that you have towards someone who's pissed you off, <laughs> like the viral video with the toddler goes. A sassy or statement or an inspiring statement. No, I'm trying to remember, remember what that sounds like. I'm looking down at my little notes that just printed <laughs> off. Well, it's, um, it's a little toddler. It was a viral video, I think, in 2017. And I don't know why it just stuck in my head, oh. but he's arguing with his mom. He's like, Linda, listen, Linda. Oh, he's like trying yeah. to get a I'd cupcake or something. It's so <laughs> cute. I'd already seen it. I thought maybe I know you've seen it before. I probably have, been a but while. you know, I have Alzheimer's, so <laughs> yeah, I have an excuse. Now that's her excuse for everything, which by the way, <laughs> uh, works well. by the way, she did a whole bunch of hyperbaric oxygen treatments, which has been miraculous Life for help, tons. helping oh, yeah amazing. helping heal her brain yeah it yeah, gets oxygen back in anybody who's wow. ever had a stroke if they have access to do that it's it saved my it saved my life yeah my that's it saved her life h bot's yeah. amazing for the for yeah strokes, so for the do brain. you have a linda moment uh linda listen maybe it's lorraine listen <laughs> yeah mom <laughs> lorraine listen <laughs> listen to me <laughs> You're always telling me to listen to uh, me. Yeah, I think, I don't know. I think I'm going to, I'm going to go back to, I'm going to be boring and go back to uh, <laughs> what I just said to be my inspiring uh, statement. Well, I mean, I hope it's inspiring to someone. Uh, obviously, I think I'm very inspiring. <laughs> but, um, right, right. She is. Just to do the right thing within your own little circle because like Confucius said, <laughs> Confucius say, <laughs> uh, we have to start with purity of heart within ourselves. And then we can have that go out to how we behave in our relationships. And then that goes out and affects our community. And then that goes out and affects the larger world. So just start with making sure that your heart is pure and right and is courageous and strong and where you need to be. And then let, let that spread out to the rest of the world and will hopefully have a positive impact on the whole world around us, including, you know, for victims that, that need our love and support. All right. I love it. I'm mm -hmm. sure if Linda had heard that, Linda would be convinced. Yeah. <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're, yeah. Pleading with Linda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So hers is a lot more altruistic and kind. One of my angriest moments through a lot of this was when uh, a family member told Chelsea that she was denying John, her dad, the atonement of Christ by what she was doing. And that made me so mad <laughs> because yeah. I thought, I thought, how, how dare you? How could somebody even do that if they wanted yeah. to? Like yeah. the atonement is a personal thing. How, how is her doing the right thing? Even mm -hmm. that made me mad. It still makes me mad when I think about how dare somebody say that to a victim of years of sexual, sexual abuse mm -hmm. who's being courageous. And then you tell them you need to stop because you are denying your dad the atonement, the atoning power oh. of the atonement. It's like, yeah. Just when you think you've heard it all, mm -hmm. like, if that's even possible, 
It's like abuse upon abuse. So, so that's my. So yours is you need to say, how dare you ever shame a victim? Yeah. How, how dare <laughs> yes. you decide who has control over the atoning powers of Jesus Christ? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Besides Jesus Christ. How dare right. you shame a victim? Yeah. So I guess how that would be. I got the same type of messages from oh. my extended family. And I'm just, yeah, I got lots of Linda listens. <laughs> like how much time? <laughs> <they> yeah. <laughs> Linda, listen, you got it all wrong. Linda, listen, stop being in a cult. <laughs> Linda, listen, listen yeah, to the survivors. Yeah. Actually, listen. Don't just pretend that you know their story because you've heard it from the perpetrator, which is mm. probably <laughs> nothing near the truth. Linda, listen to the survivors. Anyways, I'm yeah. gonna stop there because I could just keep going. But okay, I've got, I've got, I've got another one. I've got, oh, got another one. Oh. Okay, okay. Yeah, I've got a sassy. See, one. we've got her worked up now. So <laughs> yeah, now I'm mad. Now I'm getting mad. Uh, to the LDS Church and to uh -huh. everyone else out there that needs to hear this, you know, stop covering up. Be transparent, be honest, and do not require NDAs of child sexual abuse victims. That is wrong. Mm -hmm. It's unconscionable, especially when they're in a current state of trauma and fear. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah. Don't don't ever pay their bills, but don't don't make them sign away being able to speak the truth. And to all the prosecutors out there, never seal up a child sex abuse case. Never close a case with prejudice that is a child sex abuse case because that also is wrong. Don't do it. Yes. Stop. <laughs> Just stop. I we keep agree. Going? <laughs> I know. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we could. We could go for another hour and a half with Linda Listens. Right. This has been Linda so listens. great. Thank you so much for coming on, both of you, and opening up and sharing your story and all of the details. I, I mean, my jaw was on the floor for most of it. Just could not believe everything that you guys have been through. So thank you for being willing to dredge that up again and to talk about it. It really means a lot. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Elise, for letting us tell our story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Well, do you have any other final thoughts before we go? I think we're probably ready to call it a night, huh? <laughs> you feeling complete? Yeah. Yeah. Guys, if you're watching, make sure to leave those words of encouragement down below for Chelsea and Lorraine. Our guests do read the comments and it means a lot hearing those compliments and encouraging words from you. And it also boosts the algorithm so more people can see this so we can expose this story. And if you'd like to support the podcast, you can get some of our merch at cultsdeconsciousness.com under the merch tab. We have some Apostates Unite t-shirts for those Exmos out there. <laughs> and I guess Jehovah's Witnesses call them Apostates too. Um, they're for everybody, but a lot of fun stuff. You can also come with us to Costa Rica if that's something you want to do and you want to relax and get away from the cultosphere and just do something fun together. There are some spots left. You can find that in the description. You can become a patron at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. And if you like this episode, I will link two down here below. Make sure after this, if you haven't already, go watch the first episode that we did with Chelsea discussing more in depth her childhood and until next time follow your highest excitement be conscious and be well <laughs>